My name is Pastor Hal York. We'd like to welcome you to our online service here at Hastings Park Bible Church. It's September the 11th. It's a special day here at Hastings Park. It's Roundup Sunday. So if you're watching this Sunday morning and you would like to come out and uh, to the picnic after the service, you're more than welcome to do so. We'll be, the service will be ending around 11, 11.15, and right after that we'll be having a barbecue out back on the lawn, and there'll be lots of stuff for the kids, and just some just great fellowship and time to relax and just have some free hamburgers and ice cream, and, uh, and we encourage you to come, invite you to come, hope, you, hope you're able to join us. Also, it's a, bit, a busy week. We're starting up some of the programs. We had our first youth group last night, or Friday night, and a swimming party, had a great time at that. And then on Wednesday is prayer and Bible study, but it's also Awana, and we'll be beginning our Awana program at 645 on Wednesday night, to keep that in mind. And also the ladies' Bible studies will be starting up in October, the second week in October. So you might want to keep that in mind, I think it's October the 13th. There's a sign-up sheet on the information desk, and uh, there'll be a morning and an evening, as has been the case in the last few, few years. And so that's, uh, just keep that in mind as well. And then coming up on October or September the 25th, we're going to have Vessels of Honor from Peterborough. It's a quartet or trio, I believe it is. And they're going to be putting a concert on at 6.30 here at the church, so keep that in mind. Also, Creation International will be here in October, and we'll let you know more about that as the time gets closer. But uh, this is an exciting time of year, wonderful time of year, a beautiful time of year. The leaves start to turn in the the uh, gardens are beginning to bring forth their fruit, and it's just the uh, farmers' markets are going full blast. So it's a great time of year, and the uh, kids are back in school. And uh, Sunday school starts this week as well, so the September the 11th, regular Sunday school. And we're so thankful for the teachers and leaders that are building into the lives of our kids. But uh, we're, So we're just going to ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together, have a scripture reading, and then we're going to look into the Word of God for a few moments this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and for your grace, and we just pray as we open your word together that you might open our eyes and our hearts that we might indeed see wonderful things from your word, that your spirit would fill us and, and empower us and to understand and to receive what we're going to hear and apply it to our lives in such a way that it is honoring and glorifying to you. And, and we are your servants. We thank you for the beauty of this time of year and for just the just a great summer we've had, and we just pray you'll continue to bless our kids at way at school, some going to college, and the ones in high school and grade school, we ask your blessing upon them that you might protect them. It's a difficult time. I know for many parents, the young parents with young kids, and there's a lot of issues they have to wrestle with, and, and so we just pray for wisdom and guidance for them, but we just pray that you just bless our time in your word this morning, and we thank you for your goodness and for your grace and for your mercy that is found in Jesus Christ. And so we ask that you might just open our hearts and our eyes to your truth this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 45, 18-25 For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, He founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. Declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, In the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. But all the descendants of Israel will find deliverance in the Lord and will make their boast in him. May God bless the reading of his word. 
Well, we just finished a series on Samson, spent three or four weeks looking at the life of Samson in the book of Judges, and, and we're going to just take two weeks to consider some things we've considered before, but I think they're very, very important. And as we begin programs, as we begin, people start filtering back into church from cottages and so on. The summers are over, vacations are over for the most part. And we're starting up ministries and so on. I think it's always good every now and then just to, be re to review what it is we stand for. To re review what it means to be a member of a local church. To review what a local church really is and what it's founded upon. And so that's what I want to think about for the next two weeks, this week and next week. What does it mean to belong to a local church body? If you're a believer, raising your kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, church is a big part of your life. And, and it has been for a long time, if you have been a Christian for a long time. And church is going to be a huge part or should be a huge part of your life and your, the life of your child as they get older in the Lord, as they begin to grow in their Christian faith, they are going to realize, and hopefully realize even now as they go to your, as they're in your home, the church is a huge part of their life as a Christian, of growing as, as part of how God grows us up as Christians. And the reality is we're going to spend the next 50 or 60 years if the Lord tarries attending and hopefully involved using their gifts and talents in the local church. That's true of your kids. That's part of bringing them up to understand the role of the local church in their life and being committed to a local body of believers where they can invest their time and their energy and their gifts and their talents for the edification and encouragement of the body of Christ. And I think we're kind of losing sight of that, I think, in the church today. The church is optional. The church is a very small part of our life. But I think certainly God wants us to be a very big part of our life because that's how he helps us to grow. The people in that church are there to help us to grow in Christ's likeness and to build into our lives as we build into their lives. Because the reality is the gospel incorporates us into a family, the family of God. And we are justified, reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And that's the vertical dimension of our salvation. But then we are reconciled to one another. Not only are we reconciled to God, but we are reconciled to one another. And that's the, holy, the horizontal dimension, is the aspect of the one another's of the New Testament. And we know the message of the gospel. We tell everyone, Christ died for me. But the glorious truth is that Christ died for us as a church, as a body of Christ. He died for his bride, the church. And we can easily just and tragically shrink the gospel down to where it is just an individual standing before God. That, that's all it is. It's just a personal thing, me and God, and we got a good thing going kind of thing. It's an individual. It's personal. And no longer no longer see themselves as they truly are if they're born again, which in reality means that we are, when we are born again, we become part and baptized into the church, which means we become part of a larger community called the church for which we have been gifted to serve and need the gifts of others in order to grow in our Christian life. John MacArthur, several years ago, the first time I ever heard him preach, I'd never heard of him before. Washington Bible College back in 19, early 1980 was just starting to develop this and put it into a book called The, the Anatomy of the Church. And in that book, he takes, the, as the scriptures does, he takes the church and uses the an analogy of a, a body and begins to talk, break the body down to see how the different aspects of the body function and how the different aspects of the church function. And one of the core truths of that book and one of the core truths of scripture is that the body is built upon a skeleton. Five core truths that give the church the skeleton, the shape that enables it to function as it should. It's what everything else ha hangs on. You take away these things and you just have a bunch of tendons and blood vessels and organs just laying on the floor in a great big blob. They can't do anything. It's the skeleton that gives the body its, its shape, its function, 
its ability to, to do what it was created to do. And so it is in the church. And I want to talk this morning briefly. We've talked about them before, but again, I think it's very important that we remind ourselves who we are. What makes the church different from every other group? I mean, every other group that meets has skeletal principles that shape it and make, define what it is. But none of them have these five because these are unique to the church of Jesus Christ. These are what set the church apart from every other group in the world. These five skeletal principles. It's why the church is different than your local pub or fraternity or your car club or your lodge or your hockey team that you play on. It comes down to these five non-negotiable truths upon which we unashamedly stand. It's always good to review them as we're going to do. And these are things that unite us. There are things that are not up for debate. They're skeletal principles that give the body shape and form and allow it to function as it should. And so we want to look at these five real quickly this morning just to remind us of who we are. We talk about these things all of the time, but sometimes we talked about them in such a way, well, you can take them or leave them, but you cannot take or leave these. To abandon any one of these things is in reality to, to, to turn your back on the Christian faith, to turn your back on Christ and God himself. So let's look at these real quickly this morning. The first truth, the first skeletal principle that we were built upon is, is an absolute non-negotiable, as we said, is the high view of of God. It is absolutely essential that a church perceive itself as an institution for the glory of God. It's not just a place we go on Sunday because we want to do something we want to do something on Sunday morning. It's a habit. That God saved us and baptized us into the church body, the local church exists as an institution in which God might be glorified above all else. We don't come to glorify ourselves. We don't come to glorify a preacher. We don't come to glorify a musical group. We come to glorify and lift up the glorious and majestic name of God. That's the role and function, the primary role and function of the church of Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer said, and we've said this several times, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Why is the church losing such an impact on a culture today? Why is the church struggling along and so anemic in so many cases? Because it has lost its view of God, its high view, its exalted view of a holy and righteous and glorious God. Were we able to extract, Tozer says, were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes to mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. The same is true of any church and any person. A right conception of God is basic not only to the systematic theology to a practical Christian living as well. Our country may give us the right to worship any God we choose and think about God any way we please, but all they guarantee us is the right to be wrong. God gives us so much, so no such right. We don't have the option and the luxury of being wrong when it comes to the person of God. We must think right about God, which means we must think biblically about God. We do not get to define God. God has defined himself. In one sense, he's unknowable. In one sense, he's incomprehensible. But we can know something about God, and God has revealed that to us. And we do not get to pick and choose a God of our own making. Among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry because it's, it's us trying to remake God in our own image. 
Idolatry, the idolater simply imagines things about God and acts as if they were true, when in reality they are not. It's absolutely essential that the church has a high view of God and a right view of God, which we find exclusively in the Word of God. God has revealed Himself to us through the inspired writings of the Holy, the Holy Bible, the Holy Scriptures. And the sole purpose of the church, no matter what it does, is to glorify God, to demonstrate the wonders of God as a showcase for the majesty of God, the grace of God, the holiness of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, and on and on we could go. The church in North America, in some cases, seems to have forgotten who God is. That we build the church and then build our God to fit into that church. We look, look at and approach the Bible as a book about solving our problems. It's a book about us. Rather than what it truly is, is a book that reveals the God of heaven and earth who is awesome and glorious, who's a creator of everything that is. And what we need to remember is that when we know and glorify God as we should, the needs of our life are answered. We were created to know God. That's why we were created. Every need in our life is found, met, when we come to the throne of grace, when we come to, the, to God himself, because he created us to worship him and him alone. There's scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in daily Christian living that cannot be traced in the end to imperfect, unworthy, and unbiblical thoughts about God. We need to be concerned about people's needs, yes. But there is a balance that must be found, and that begins with a high view and a right view of God. The bottom line in all of this, I believe, is that we need to feel the weight of of God in our life. We need to take God seriously and exalt Him. To glorify means to, sh to shine forth, but it also carries the idea of feeling the weight, the responsibility of understanding who God is and, and magnifying Him to the world as He truly is. Taking Him seriously in our life. We don't want to have a man-centered church. We are to reach out to people in the love of Christ, but God is still to be the focus of our worship and our life. Listen to these words from great Psalm 145. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Oh, the glorious splendor of your majesty. And on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and will tell of your greatness. Verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. And make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. One writer has said that the fundamental problem in the evangelical world today is not an inadequate technique, insufficient organization, or an antiquated music. The fundamental problem in the evangelical world is that God rests too unimportantly and insignificantly upon the church. His truth is too distant. His grace is too ordinary. His judgment is too benign. His gospel too easy and his Christ too common. It's from David Wells. If we were to give a seminar on marriage in a church or parenting, or how to be successful in life. No doubt, there will be all kinds of people here no matter what, no matter what day of the week we offered it. 
No matter what night it was offered, there would be people. If we advertised it, there would be people coming. This place would probably be almost full. But if we advertised, we're going to study God, we're going to study theology, I wonder how many people would show up. Because most people consider theology to be irrelevant. Why? Because they can't think of any way whatsoever where it has any impact on their life. And that's what David Wells is saying in this quote. The fundamental problem in the evangelical world is that God rests too and unimportantly and insignificantly upon the church. Theology means nothing to me. This is the attitude of most Christians. Because it's irrelevant to my life. I don't think about God when I decide what I'm going to do with my life, who I'm going to marry, what I'm going to do on the weekend, how I'm going to live my life, what values and priorities I'm going to live by, what moral standards I'm going to uphold in my life. How much relevance does God have in any of those decisions in our life? Many in the church would say very little. And many in the church, no doubt, would have to question whether they know God at all, if that's their attitude. We must take God, and we should take God seriously if we are to expect unbelievers to take God seriously. If we don't have this, this attitude, then there are other four of these things we're going to look at are basically irrelevant. If we don't have a high view of God, it doesn't matter what else we have. We really have nothing. But as we're going to see, these build on one another. And if you don't have a high view of God, you probably don't have the rest of these either. So a high view of God is principle number one, skeletal, skeletal number one, skeletal principle number one, a high view of God. Number two is the absolute authority of Scripture. If we have a high view of God, we're going to have a high view of God's Word. Romans 1.18 says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. To insist in this world today that there is absolute truth and that the Bible is absolute truth and authoritative truth brings us to a head to a confrontation with the world that we're living in. But that's not only true today, it was true even in Jesus' day. They marveled when Jesus spoke, that he spoke with one who had authority. They didn't just marvel, they, they, they wig, wig, tried to wiggle out from underneath it. We will not have this man rule over us, they said. But we must have an absolute, believe in the absolute authority of Scripture. Speak, the Bible speaks to us like no other book. No other book. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 119, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The Bible is inspired. God breathed the word of God is Given by instant scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And we'll read every other book Christian writers write, but how many times do we read those when we don't read the Bible? And this is the only book that's inspired. This is the only book God wrote. And we need to believe it speaks to us with absolute authority. Why? Because God wrote it. And he has absolute authority over every life that's ever lived. Inspiration of God. Infallible refers to the truth of Scripture as a whole. It's without error. Er inerrancy focuses on the accuracy of every single word. Inerrancy and infallibility are grounded in the character of God who is perfect, without error, without blemish. God speaks to us with an inerrant, infallible, inspired word, an authoritative word, which means we can trust the Bible. The Bible's never had to be updated. It will never steer you wrong or deceive you. It'll never let you down. 
God's word addresses the soul's every need. Listen to these words in Psalms 19, very familiar words. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. These are all referring to the Bible, the Word of God. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. God's word addresses every need in the Christian life, every one. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 176, the longest chapter in the Bible, is devoted exclusively to the word of God, the attributes of the word of God what it is, what our attitude towards it should be. We must have a high view of the Word of God. God's Word is the only source of divine authority in your life. It's not the church, it's not the pastor, it's not the deacons, it's not the elders. God's Word is the only source of divine authority in your life. I have no authority as a pastor standing up here to tell you anything. The only authority I have is that which is invested to me as I teach the Word of God. And that's what speaks to, to us, all of us, myself included, with absolute and ultimate authority. The Word of God is our ultimate authority in life. The, the Word of God is the ultimate authority in the church, not tradition. Not like we've always done it this way before. The Bible is the authority of the church. The church is not the authority over the Bible. If someone was watching our life, and by the way, they are, all of us, would they say you have the absolute authority of Scripture as the basis of your life and conduct? Would they say that you have a high view of God? The Bible speaks to us. With authority. Can we have a high view of God and a low view of His Word? The answer is no. It's no. If one is true, then the other will be also. And this leads quite easily into the next skeletal principle, number three. We must have a high view of God, a high view of God's Word, and we must believe in the importance of teaching sound doctrine, the importance of understanding the Word of God of teaching the Word of God. Those who teach and emphasize sound doctrine in our society are labeled as divisive and narrow-minded and old-fashioned. Why? Because men don't like absolute truth. Because absolute truth, you can't wiggle out from underneath it. You can't, under, you can't wiggle out from underneath gravity. You can't wiggle up from underneath the laws of nature, the laws of physics, and so on, that God has placed in our natural world. You can't do it. But somehow when it comes to the spiritual truth, we want to be able to form our own gods, live our lives without the authority of God, the eyes of God watching over us. We want to live an autonomous life, free from God, free from accountability, free from authority. So we don't want anything to do with sound doctrine, with teaching. We'll come to church and listen to movies, or listen to singing, but they have to preach so long. And we think our, and our songs need to reinforce what we teach. That's why we sing the songs that we do. But what does it mean, sound doctrine? Paul tells Timothy several times in his letters to preach sound doctrine. The word sound means simply this, whole or complete, healthy, trustworthy, faithful, safe, honest, solid, firm, secure, good, virtuous, deep, right. Teach Our teaching needs to have all of these components to it, which means we must teach the Word of God, not our opinion, not I've heard, you've heard it said, but thus says the Lord. People need to understand 
doctrine. But people say, well, yeah, but doctrine divides, truth divides. Well, of course it does. Of course it does. If you go to a, a math class and you give a test to a bunch of students in math about adding and subtracting numbers, and you give them a bunch of numbers to add and to subtract, and they pass in that test, some of them are going to get A's, some of them are going to get B's, some of them are going to fail it all together. Why? Because there's absolute truth, there's absolute right answers to those equations. And the people that got it wrong were wrong. They failed. The people that got it right passed. That's what truth does. That's what truth does. If you build an airplane and ignore the, dog, the, the laws of physics and aerodynamics, you can build the most beautiful plane in the world, but it'll never get off the ground. Why? Because you can't argue with truth. You can't ignore it. The same is true when it comes to spiritual realities. We can't ignore what the Bible tells us. It speaks to us with absolute authority. It speaks to us with absolute truthfulness. It does not lie. And the truths it reveals are, are solid about who God is, how we come into a relationship with God. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's not through good works. It's not through going to church. It's not through saying a prayer. We are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ and placing our faith in Christ alone. As God opens up our hearts and our minds and draws us to himself by his grace, we begin to discern that we need a Savior, and we see Christ lifted up in Scripture, and He is our Savior, the only one. But today, the church, there's so much doctrinal ambivalence, nobody knows what they believe anymore. It used to be you could go to this denomination or that denomination, and there was distinctions, and they weren't always heretical. They are just little distinctions about here, how they do this and how they do that, and so on. But now you get people going to churches for that are totally off the wall because nobody in either church knows what they believe, so it really doesn't matter where you go to church because nobody knows what they believe anyway. But it does matter where you go to church, and it does matter what you believe because if you believe a lie, you go to hell. If you reject Jesus Christ, hell is the end for your life for eternity. If you embrace the truth of the cross in Jesus Christ and you're born again, God reconciles us to God through, we are reconciled to God through Christ and we will have a home in heaven forever because of what Christ did for us on the cross. But sadly today, doctrine is becoming a thing of the past and we're trying to stand, plant ourselves in midair and wonder why we can't get any traction in our Christian life. Your children need to understand doctrine, parents. We need to teach it to them. There needs to be doctrinal clarity. Why? Because the church is not the only institution that teaches doctrine. You go on YouTube, and you're going to be inundated with doctrine, not just from churches, but morality. In the classroom, you're going to hear doctrine taught. Teachings about God, what you should think about God, what you should think about how God has designed the man, men and women. Those are doctrines. Those are doctrines. How you get to heaven, how you please God. Some say we just have to do good works, do good things, be a good person. Those are doctrines. They're doctrines. Doctrines of demons. The world is filled with the people who are teaching doctrine. Things about God that are not true. Things about morality that are not true. Things about how you get to heaven that are not true. They're selling tickets to heaven. As Matthew 7 says, they're selling tickets to the wide road, through the wide gate. In the end is destruction. But they're selling the tickets and on those tickets is all kinds of doctrine. Believe this, believe this, believe this, and you'll go to heaven. The only problem is it never gets you there. False doctrine never saved anyone, and it never will. 
We are living in a time and day and age where false teachers have unprecedented access to every one of us. We listen, turn people on in our living rooms and watch them, listen to them teach. We would never invite them into our home. But we'll sit there and listen to them on TV and drink it right up and not understanding what they're saying is absolute foolishness, absolute falsehood, lies. It's not true because we don't have the ability to discern because we don't take we don't have a high view of God, we don't have a high view of His Word, and therefore we don't have a high view of truth, absolute truth. Doctrines of demons, Paul warned Timothy about pride, self-love, the New Age, humanism, self-love, the new morality, all this stuff is getting pumped at us from people who are teaching doctrine. The premarital sex is okay as long as you love each other. You have the power within yourself to solve your own problems. That the most important thing in life is to be happy. The children are basically good, and if you're encouraged and given the proper environment, they will demonstrate this goodness. The chastisement is not good for children. You're hearing these doctrines every day. And they're being espoused sometimes by people who stand behind pulpits and write books under the Christian label. And they're lies. They're lies. They're doctrines. Doctrines of demons. Doctrines that harm, not help. And sadly, we in our culture today, in our churches, are more afraid of controversy than we are of false doctrine. We're, more, we're, we're far more afraid of being labeled intolerant than we are being labeled and we are pointing out falsehood. Christianity that is not strong enough to, to strive for the truth can never possess the nerve to die for the truth. The truth not worth defending very soon comes to be seen as a truth not worth professing. One writer has stated that we live in a time when even those in the church operate in such a sphere in their beliefs about the supernatural that they are rendered in a large part irrelevant. In that sense, sound doctrine is disappearing in the church. We want to hear about me. We want to hear about how to be this, how to be that. And it's not saying there's not a place for, for helping us understanding what the Word of God says about marriage and parenting and so on, because it says a lot about it. it says, but that's not all it talks about. And if you just want to embrace that and ignore the high view of God and ignore theology and the God who instituted marriage and instituted morality, you're not going to get very far. We're becoming, in some respects, as Stephen Charnock says, practical atheists. What we confess is having little influence on what, how we live. Consequently, you have many unbiblical and ungodly decisions being made under the banner of godly Christian living. Back in Israel's day, the prophets where there's truth, it's central in life. Theology is always close, close at hand. But listen to how the, the prophets talked in Israel's day. The priests did not say in Jeremiah 2.8, the priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. Think about it. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Chapter 5, the prophets prophesied falsely. And the priests rule by their own power. My people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? The writer of Sol Solomon said to his son, I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. We must always be on guard against becoming a church where biblical truth is important but separated from the rest of life. We dare not do that in our life. We are conformed into the image of Christ by understanding what that image looks like and who Christ is. And by the Spirit that lives within us, having a right understanding of the Holy Spirit, right understanding of Christ and His cross, a right understanding of who God is in this world. And that begins by understanding doctrine. 
theology. If you go back in the early church and look at the Westminster Catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, all these catechisms, what were they for? They were to teach our children doctrine. They were, the whole purpose was to teach in, in our kids how to think biblically, to teach them what they understood, what the Bible says about key issues in concise form so they could remember it. And we need to be teaching our children at home. It's not the church's job. It's not the Sunday school's job. It's not your Christian school's job. Mom and dad, if you're a Christian, you need to be teaching your children the Word of God. You need to be teaching your children doctrine. It's obviously not doc read out of a theological journal, but doctrine that's simplified to the place where they can understand it. Teach them who God is, who they are in light of who God is, that God created them male and female, that God created them to be married one day possibly. And if they're married, that's when morality begins to take shape and the union with husband and wife is a beautiful thing. Outside of it, it's an abomination, God says. We need to teach that to our kids. Teach them that they're sinners, that they need a Savior. Teach them theology. Teach them the Bible. We're, we don't want to become a place where we believe the Bible is truth and believe the Bible is important, but nobody knows what the truth is. Nobody knows what it is. That's what the church was like back in the dark ages. And we have books and YouTube and probably I've, I've got probably 12 Bibles in my office. All of us probably got at least one if not more Bibles in our home, and yet we're totally, well, yet we're ignorant of the truth. To whom much is given, much is required. We must teach and understand sound doctrine because if we don't, we have no idea who we are, who God is. And we cease to function if we lose that skeletal principle. We can't move. We can't do anything. Fourthly, a commitment to personal holiness there is a pull in every life and every family away from holiness, away from standards, and it is a pull downward to maintain standards and attitudes in certain levels of family and personal life. It is a constant struggle and involves constant reminders. We can't help but go back and think about Samson we've been looking at for the last three weeks. We saw the pull, the pull to immorality, the pull to sensualness, the pull to pursuing his passion outside of God's parameters, and it destroyed his life, ultimately. There's a constant pull in our culture downward. And if we're not committed to personal holiness, we're going to find ourselves drifting away from God, godly morality, godly holiness and purity in life. You do not drift into a holy, godly life. You do not drift into a good marriage. You do not drift into having godly, parent, godly children or teaching godly, our children godly truth. God's the one that obviously has to save them and open up their heart. We do not drift, though, into having a godly family. It's a battle. It's a battle every day. And we must have commitment. There must be a commitment in our life to the truths of Scripture when it comes to growing in our Christian life. We find that page after page after page in the Paul's letters and Peter's writing that we've been given everything we need to pertain to life and godliness. Paul says we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says I want to know Him. I haven't arrived. I want to keep knowing. I want to keep learning. We have a hunger for truth and a commitment to living out that truth in personal holiness. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, like, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear, of, the fear of God. You know what that means? It means exactly what it says. Having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Yeah, but I'm busy. So what? I haven't got time right now. I'll do it a little later on in my life. When my kids are gone, i got more spare time. 
No. That's our call as a parent. That's our call as a single person. That's our call as an old person. It's called a person of grandparents. You've been married 50 years or five days. If you're single or married, it doesn't matter. God calls us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And he calls us to do that with authority, loving authority, because he knows that is the best life. That is the greatest life you could ever be called to. Sin destroys us. Immorality destroys us. It destroys everything God says is good. Marriage, relationships, sin destroys all of that. God does not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The church is called to shine this light's in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. And if the church is going to be salt and light, it must be holy. Lot moved into Sodom and tried to maintain his purity, but in doing so, he lost his children. He tried to appease the world with his children. We know the story. and won't take the time to read it. He said, we need to get out of here. And his sons-in-laws, his children, they just mocked him. Mocked him. It's a tragic, tragic story. Lot left with his wife and his daughters. It's a tragic story. Tried to appease the world with his children. Christians were called to live in a pure, a pure life, and we cannot compromise that. We need to enforce a standard of purity among ourselves. The church is called to enforce holiness. And it does this through church discipline. Then lastly, spiritual authority. We must have an understanding of spiritual authority, spiritual leadership. That God mediates his rule in this, in this church through spiritual godly leaders. 1 Thessalonians 5, Hebrews 13, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, Acts 6. And many churches are constant battlegrounds because no one wants understands that they wants to be under any authority whatsoever. No one needs, sees the need for submission, but are more like what Paul describes, all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. We need to have an understanding of spiritual authority in the church. God has placed people over you to help you. Not, it's a loving authority. It's a very soft authority, but it's nonetheless, they're there to help you grow in your Christian life. Not to be lords over you or masters over you, but to be people who are there to help you. And we're accountable to God for that. If the church is going to be the body of Christ, it has to have the right framework. It must have a high view of God. The pursuit of the church must be to know God and seeking to know God. The authority of Scripture must be recognized because it's through the Bible that we know God. A church should have a high view of Scripture and a commitment to teaching sound doctrine. And in so doing so, the people of God will have a desire to seek personal holiness and submit their souls to the care of those the Lord has placed over them as spiritual authorities. That's how God has designed His church to function. And we need these five non-negotiable principles to help us be the church God wants us to be. You want to know how that looks like? Read the book of Acts. We find all of these in the early church. You take any one of these away and the church ceases to be what God intended it to be. We must unashamedly stand upon the, and affirm our lives and the life of this church on these five non-negotiable truths. Everything we do needs to be evaluated in light of these five things. And we're not perfect. We never will be. We don't get it right every time, and we never will. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be aiming for these five things. Attitudes and functions and programs all flow out of these five skeletal truths. And the, the purpose of this isn't to get you to examine and see how everybody else around you is doing. It's to see how you are doing. How are we, you doing as an individual? How are we doing as a church? Not everybody else's church. It doesn't matter. How are we doing? 
We need to uphold these five truths. We need to uphold these five truths in our church and in our own lives. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make us boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I'm positively sure after many years of observation and prayer that the basis of all our trouble today in religious circles is that our God is too small. The Bible says to magnify the Lord. He doesn't mean that we are to make God big. We can't make him. He's as big. We can't make God any bigger than he is. But we are to see him as big. And that's the difference. We don't make him big. He is. He fills the universe. He lives outside. He's bigger than the universe. It's more glorious. But we don't see him like that. And to magnify him is to begin to see him as he really is. We cannot make God bigger, but we can only see him bigger. And one writer said that a meeting is not big because a lot of people are present. A meeting is big because a number of people, small or great, see a big God in the meeting. That's what we long to have at Hastings Park Bible Church. Not big numbers. Because we can get big numbers. We just got to tweak a few things here and there, tweak our message. Tweak our music, sing more popular songs, sing songs you're hearing on the radio, and get, make, get messages about people and us and how to be a better this and a better that. And you could have a, probably fill this place. But we don't want that kind of a big meeting. When we come together as a church, we want it to be a big meeting because we have a, we have a big God in our midst. We worship a big God, a sovereign God. And we've come to magnify him, to see him and learn of him, that we might magnify him even more in our life. These are the core truths that unite us. A high view of God, the absolute authority of Scripture, doctrinal clarity, commitment to personal holiness, and understanding spiritual authority. These are the truths that unite us. But what does it mean to belong to a local church? Do we just sit around and sing kumbaya, sway back and forth and go home? It means so much more than that, and we're going to look at that next week to see what it means to belong to a local church, to be in, committed to a local church. Your kids need to understand this. You need to understand this, because if they're a believer in Jesus Christ, church is going to be part, hopefully part of their life if the Lord tarries for the rest of their life. But they learn that, and they get that modeled by watching and seeing the habits that are established in their life as young people. Train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. Well, part of that is understanding the centrality of the importance of the church in our life as a Christian. Your kids need to see that and understand that, and you need to train them up in that. They need to see you getting involved you need to see how important a church is to you as a mother, as a father. And they'll see it. They'll see it. And they'll understand and begin to realize, you know, church is not just a, a social club. It's a place we need to be committed to. We need to be there on a regular basis because I need to be there and the people there need me to be there. Not why, because I'm so special. No, because we all have something to contribute to the health of the body of Christ. I have gifts and abilities that nobody else has, and so do you. And if I'm not doing them, they're not getting done. We need to have that attitude, and we'll see what that means and looks like next week, Lord willing. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you are building your church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you're building it on these five foundational truths that give it a skeleton, that allow it to function and move in this world as it should. And these are five areas in the church today that are being knocked down. And that's why the church is having so little impact, because it's just, it's just a blob of attitudes and laying on the floor, with no, and they can't move. They're helpless. They have no structure. They have no form. But God is, is these five truths to help us, that put us together, help us move, help us to become, help us everything else work as it should. 
and that we can be who you've called us to be. The church exalts and magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we are not members of the church, Lord, because we just signed a card. We're members of the church of Jesus Christ because we've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We've been redeemed, baptized into the body of Christ through the blood of Christ by the Spirit of God. And we become part of the, the local church, but we're also part of the church universal. And we all have a part to play. But Father, may we never get so enamored, Lord, with the part we have to play without forgetting who it is we're serving. May we always be endeavoring in our lives to be learning more and more about you, that Paul said that I might know him. We might have a high view of God, a right view of God, a biblical view of God. And we might just sing of your wonder and your majesty and your holiness and the glory of who you are and be in awe be in awe. Never cease to be amazed. And then we have a high view of your word. And then we seek to understand it, a doctrine, and what it teaches about you, what it teaches about Jesus Christ, about his cross, about how we become a believer in Jesus Christ, what the cross means. It means that Christ hung on the cross and died there for us. He bore our sins. You laid on him the iniquity of us all, and that's all who will believe in that and believe that we're sinners and believe Jesus died on the cross for us, we will be born again. We become new creations in Christ. We're saved. We're saved from our sin. We're saved from hell. We're saved from the wrath of God because God poured out his wrath on Christ. And we either die and bear the wrath of God ourselves for our sin or we acknowledge the fact that that sin that deserved the wrath of God was laid on Christ and God laid, poured out his wrath on his own son that I might be forgiven and know the joys and the fellowship with God forever in heaven. Lord, it's what love we can never begin to comprehend, but we need to understand that's doctrine, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross. We need to understand that. We need to understand how to present it. But ultimately, we need to give you the glory for it's only as you work in the hearts of people will it, it be understood. And we pray that that might take place. I know many here are praying for loved ones, and we pray that you might open their hearts and their minds to the truth of who God is, the truth of who they are, and see Christ as a wonderful Savior and as their only hope. So, Father, we just pray you'll bless these words this morning to each one. And may we contemplate again what it means to be a member of a local church, and maybe we come with hearts prepared to look at that again next week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.